please turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're God's children, aren't we? Ephesians chapter 3. Again, we want to continue the thought of the spiritual unity that we have in Christ. And uh, I thought that perhaps as we begin, I should turn your attention to the first 11 verses of the third chapter, because this really, this is really the revelation that God gives that sets up the unity that uh, if you're a believer, you are a part of, whether you feel it, see it, smell it, you're part of this unity. Ephesians 1, or 3, verse 1 says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, Gentile. Whenever I see the word Gentiles, by the way, it's the word ethnos, and it's the same word that is used to describe nations. So Gentiles are the nations. They're the non-Jews, okay, or the nations. That's me and perhaps most of you that are here. Uh, uh, the prisoner of Christ for the Gentiles, for the nations. If you have heard of the dispensation or the stewardship of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation, okay, God revealed something supernaturally to Paul, and we're going to get to find out what that is. He made known unto me the mystery. What is a mystery in the Bible? Something that formerly wasn't known, but that God divinely, he reveals it. Supernatural reveals it here. He reveals it to us through the Apostle Paul. And now let's find out what that mystery was. It, in ages, it wasn't known to the sons of men, to human beings, but it's now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit of God. He's the revealer. What is it? That the nations, the Gentiles, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 7. Wherefore, I was made a minister, a servant, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am, the, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the nations the unsearchable riches of Messiah, Jesus. And, look at, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, the God who created all things by Jesus Christ, here it is, to the intent that now unto, whoa, not us, not human beings, but principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's the, un, that's the spirits in the unseen realm. Sometimes they're called angels, but it's spirits in the unseen realm. Principalities and powers in heavenly places that it might be known to them by the church. The church, who's the church? The church are all blood-bought, born-again people. If you are a genuine believer, you're part of a large group called the church. And it's not talking about this specific local church, but in a universal sense, okay? So this universal church, if you will, this total body of Christ is what for? To make manifest, to make apparent the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to find out exactly what that is. And it just is wonderful. It really is. But before we go any further, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the revelation that you gave Paul that he shares with all of us here in this book of Ephesians, that oneness, that unity, that all believers share in Christ, how vital that is, how wonderful it is. Now, Lord, would you open our eyes that we might be able to understand because 
I can't comprehend this. Certainly none of us can totally comprehend it. But Lord, give us enough that we understand that our hearts would just be led to worship. That you and your remarkable plan of redemption would just overwhelm us with thankful, grateful, and uh, praising hearts. We just ask, Lord, this in Jesus' name. That is for his sake. Amen. Well, this is amazing because ever since the Garden of Eden, where that fall into sin took place, God's human family has been divided. I don't think that our country, the U.S., has been more divided now than perhaps since the Civil War. Well, let's go back and let's just think about this. In Genesis 11, at what is called the Tower of Babel, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8, a, a passage that we looked at recently, God, I'm going to put it in human terms, not to demean God, but just so we understand, God was fed up with the nations because of their idolatry. He was fed up and he disinherited the nations. And when he disinherited them, he handed over the nations of this earth to these spirit beings, these principalities and powers in heavenly places in the unseen realm. Not only that, we learn from Genesis 11 that he also dispersed the nations throughout the earth so that they scattered. And uh, he did that by confusing their languages so that they couldn't understand one another. And they had to uh, break off and get with people that they could understand. And he accomplished his purpose of overspreading the earth that way after the, the flood of Noah. And then the next chapter, 12, tells us that God began fresh with a man named Abram to bring about a new family, a new human family. And Abram's descendants, the people that we know as the Jewish people, they then became the channel, the conduit, through which God's plan of redemption would uh, be set forth and uh, would bring back eventually all these nations that God disinherited and handed into the, uh, uh, to the hands of these, these principalities and powers the, in that unseen realm, that through Abram's seed, he would bring back the nations to himself. The letter that we're in, the book of Ephesians, reveals to us a new divine update from God that expresses the miraculous accomplishment that he has brought in human relations. He has brought about, Ephesians tells us, a loving spiritual oneness that is only found in Christ, believers in Christ. And this loving spiritual oneness, Paul tells us in this Ephesian letter, literally erases human prejudices and obliterates any racial tensions. Only in Christ. This is that, you know, the theme of the book of Ephesians, by the way, is in Christ. It's the unity, that spiritual unity that we were talking about today already that believers share. It's in Christ. By the way, Colossians is a parallel to the book of Ephesians, but it takes a different uh, uh, angle. Colossians, it's Christ in you, but Ephesians is you in Christ. And that is the spiritual connection or joining together that believers have the moment that they are saved to the Lord Jesus Christ and thus to each other because we become one body in him. So the fulfillment of God's promised redemption plan using Israel, and of course Israel failed, and the Messiah filled the gap, using Israel and the Messiah to restore the nations that he disinherited at Babel by bringing Abraham's Jewish descendants together 
with former pagan nations into a oneness with himself. That's what Ephesians 3 was talking about that we read. To bring these two into oneness with himself and thus creating a, a unity masterpiece. Remember that passage in chapter 2? You are his workmanship. The word workmanship is masterpiece. And yeah, while well, that can pertain to an individual, it's about the whole thing. It's about the unity of the body of Christ. We are a unity masterpiece altogether that God has put. God's established this. I want you to turn then over to chapter 4 in Ephesians. And I really want to focus in on that third verse because this is this is what we're talking, the oneness that we have in Christ. We are one in Christ. We have this spiritual unity in Christ. Here is what he says uh, in the second verse. Let's just start in verse one. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul writes this from Roman prison, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, that you walk worthy. How do you do that? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. In other words, that uh, you are patient, that you are patient and forgiving each other uh, because of the fact that, as he says, you're spiritually connected to each other. You know, families, physical families, where uh, we have the that blood ties, right? We're, we're all one family, but how many families get along? <laughs> you have spouses that are fighting with one another. You have kids that are fighting one another. Uh, you have uh, parents and children fighting each other. So you can be one family and yet <laughs> not be unified at all. What he's talking about here is that God has established a human family that is joined together. And he tells us in that second verse of chapter four that what he has done spiritually, he wants to be practically lived out in our lives. That we endure one another because of the love that we have, that he has put in our heart in that we are all one family. Now, it's very clear when I read verse three, let's continue, bearing, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep, to guard carefully, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's very clear to me that the unity of the spirit has already been established. We're not called to establish it here. We're called to keep it. We're called to maintain it. Okay, so... The unity of the spirit, this spiritual unity, this oneness that we have in Christ is already an established fact. It's God's plan that he's divinely revealed. The amazing unity that believers share in Christ, where former pagan nations are placed in the same family with God's chosen Jewish people. That's what the book of Ephesians is teaching us about. That wonderful plan. In fact, go back to chapter 2 a moment and pick up in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the, the circumcision, the Jews, in the flesh made by hands, that at, the, at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, the nations are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I mean, these verses are, are very deep and rich and we don't have time to unpack them. But he has abolished, verse 15, in his death, He's abolished the, the, the enmity, the hostility, the law of the commandments containing them to make in himself of two, the nations and the Jewish, the chosen Jewish people, one new man making peace. 
God's already established that. That's his plan. It's divinely revealed to us here that the nations share equality with God's uh, chosen Jewish people. We share God's inheritance and God's blessing with them. We are because we're part of the same family. And by the way, I don't know if you caught it, but when we read the first 11 verses of chapter 3 as we began our thoughts this afternoon, all of this was formally hidden. All of this was uh, secret because I believe that it was to be hidden from the unseen realm so that they couldn't prevent it from happening. But now it's revealed after the fact, after it's happened, afterward God reveals it through his holy apostles and prophets, and we get to find out the truth about it. That's God's plan. It's established. And it means this. It means that human beings, people, people become God's sacred place on this earth. You remember in the Old Testament, there was, first of all, the tabernacle where God met with his people, and then the temple that was erected there in Jerusalem. But what we learn from this truth, and uh, we didn't read it all, but uh, even in the ending of chapter 2, he tells us that in this particular time, that New Testament believers, the church and believers individually, our God's sacred place. We're his tabernacle. We're his temple. In fact, there are times when Paul talks about the believer's body as a tent, just like the tabernacle was a tent. We're God's sacred place. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, the church is God's sacred place as a whole. And in 1 Corinthians 6, the individual believer is God's sacred place. It's the place, the church, the believer is the place where God tabernacles on this earth. And he does so through the Spirit. Uh, Chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, really emphasize that. That basically, and here's the, the, think about this. The same presence that filled the Old Testament place fills us. Remember how glorious that's described in the Old Testament, that Shekinah glory, that glory cloud that dwelt over the uh, Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and in Solomon's temple. That's the same presence that fills us. And we are thus set apart as God's sacred place by the indwelling spirit in the midst of this dark world that we live in. God's given us his light. Think of it this way. There's a map on the back wall there, but just think of a map like that, that all of those countries in the world were black. Think about that. Imagine a world map in which all the countries are in black. And there are little points of light marking out individual Christians on that map in different parts, in different countries. And then the church marked and spread out globally. That's the picture here. We are God's sacred place in a very dark world. In a world that is dark because it belongs or it's being uh, usurped and run by a very dark prince. His name is Satan. He's the God of this world. Now, what is the purpose that God established this spiritual unity? Well, very clearly, we already have seen it this morning, uh, but I'm going to say there's two purposes. Number one is to accomplish what we call the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, some of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended to heaven, he said, go and make disciples. Literally, as you are going. In other words, whenever you go and wherever you go, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. 
And these that's the reason why God makes us his sacred place wherever we are on this earth, that we might spread out and that we might take back the ground that God disinherited when he disinherited the nations, that we take back that ground from the enemy. The prophets spoke of this. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 9. I'm sure a verse that you're familiar with because it's a messianic verse. It's, it, it refers to Jesus where he says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And he's talking about Galilee, where the Gentiles, where the nations were living in Israel. He said, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Okay, that's the purpose why we're God's sacred place on this earth. And again, in chapter 60 of Isaiah's prophecy, arise, shine, for thy light is come. That's to Israel, the Messiah. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness, the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the nations shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. God's established spiritual unity among the people of God for this purpose, that as his sacred place, we might fulfill the great commission. And the second reason, if you look in Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm not going to take the time to read verses 14 to 20, but it's a wonderful prayer that Paul prays for uh, this church and for believers, that that sacred place that God establishes in this earth by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit of God that indwells opens up unlimited resources to believers, to the church, to empower them with an inner strength that enables them to grow deep down into God's love to experience the fullness of life. That's what he's talking about, uh, for example, in verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints. Of course, the love of God, to know the love of Christ that is, that is beyond comprehension, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So the second purpose for spiritual unity is not only fulfill the Great Commission, but to bring spiritual growth to the church, spiritual growth to our lives, growing down deep in God's love that we might experience all the fullness of it. We could even uh, look to in chapter 4 where we were concentrating on that third verse, and there he talks about the gifts that he gives to his church, for what purpose? That it might, uh, uh, that they might then be the means through which the church edifies itself. The body of Christ is edified till we all come to a unity of faith. That the reality of that spiritual unity be worked out more and more, that we might enjoy that fullness of life. So it's already established, this spiritual unity. And getting back to 4 and verse 3 in Ephesians, he says, endeavor to keep it. Endeavor to keep the unity. So it, it's been established. It's our responsibility that it be maintained. So while the fact of spiritual oneness is permanent, its function has to be maintained. And that happens when each one of us participates in cooperation with the Lord, that we make, as he says in that third verse, every effort to possess God's peace in our own hearts and God's patience, that we would make allowance for each other's faults because of the love that we have in us, which is the Holy Spirit of God. That's what verse two is all about. 
That's how it's maintained. That's how this spiritual unity is maintained in our lives. One of the best illustrations in all of the Bible of the unity that we have in God is found in the 133rd Psalm. You want to turn there with me? Because this is where we'll end up. Psalm 133, it's just three verses. It's a beautiful picture of spiritual unity. It's the harmony that is expressed because we are joined to each other in the Lord. We share a oneness in God. And it's not just a, it's also a oneness in heart. We're of one heart, not just a family oneness, but a heart oneness that is established by us cooperating with the indwelling spirit. Notice how he puts it in Psalm 133, the first verse. Behold, how good, how pleasant or delightful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The inexpressible delight of an experience where you have God's people actually functioning as they really are meant to in unity with one another, with that love of God flowing out of them like those rivers. I want you to note verse two. Here's the, the beauty of the illustration. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And it's actually talking about the anoint when, when Aaron was anointed as the high priest of Israel. And that, uh, that special consecrated oil that he was anointed with, it was poured upon his head. It ran down his beard. And the picture is it, it ran down the collar of his robe and just, again, permeated his whole uh, person with this frag fragrance. This is a picture. This is a picture of God's human family, specifically Israel but it can be applied to all of God's human family. Like the priestly oil that consecrated that uh, high priest and created the people uh, and created what the people of Israel were meant to. Did you know the whole nation really were supposed to be a kingdom of priests, right? In the giving of the law, they're at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, I think it's verse 6. Israel as a whole are called a kingdom of priests to God. And so the consecration of Aaron is simply a picture of the priestly people that the nation of Israel was meant to be. They were meant to be a fragrant blessing to all the nations on this planet. They failed, but Jesus filled the gap. And fulfills the picture. But this is what is pictured here. It's an illustration of Israel as God's human family to reach all the other human beings on the earth that they might all be together, that one family, that one human family. But what's even more amazing is the third verse. Because here it says, as the dew of Hermon, that's the highest mountain in Israel. It's over almost 9,000 feet. Um, it's snow-capped most of the year. And uh, it's where skiing takes place in Israel. Mount Hermon, it's way up in, uh, in the Golan Heights. It's as far north as you can go, right on the Syrian border. It's right uh, above that place where Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, to the gates of hell, as they were called there, and says, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? What you need to know about Mount Hermon is that in Jewish thinking, that was the place where the, the pagan gods dwelt. That was the mountain of the gods, the great mountain in the north, Mount Hermon, but look at what is pictured here. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. What's pictured here is 
that Mount Hermon, the mountain of the pagan gods, that great mountain in the north, its influence is falling on Zion, and Zion is Jerusalem. Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. That's the place where the Jewish people worship. That's the place God has chosen on this earth for himself. What you have happening here is just an amazing thing is you have God taking Mount Hermon, which is the, the place that the pagan gods, the, the principalities and powers, you might say, where they lived, where they ruled from, and you have them, those principalities and powers, being joined with God's place and God's people. And I think what you have pictured here is simply this, the unity that God will ultimately bring between his heavenly family and his earthly family, the ultimate end of God's marvelous redemption plan. It's said that there is coming a day when God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and that new heaven will rest upon a new earth. And God's human and God's divine family, God's heavenly family, you might say, will live together in unity where God is the God of all. It's a refreshing unity that uh, just is permanent. It never ends. It's the whole earth becomes a new Garden of Eden, if you will. And this is what he says, for the Lord, there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forever more. Wonderful truth. I mean, that's what spiritual unity is headed for. That's what it's all about. 